can technology save us? It's a huge question for what I do. I mean, I teach robotics, right? And more important to me is what skill can I teach to help save us, the planet? I seriously believe that's a possibility. But what I'm going to start with is showing a little bit about a trend in technology, what happens to technology over time. Believe it or not, that's four little boys. I know the last one looks like a little, but four little boys, about three or four years old. They're wearing uh, hats. The hats change a bit, but as human beings, they don't change much. In uh, the lower picture there, that's a 2000 626 Mazda. The next picture is a 1961 Plymouth Valiant. The next picture is a 1930 Model A Ford. And the next picture is no car, because that picture is 1906. Ford made its first mass-produced car in 1907. So besides the picture being rare for 1906, if you saw a car in 1906, you'd probably stop and stare and watch it drive by. With cars are everywhere now. We live in this time period where technology is amazing. I mean, look at the technology around us right now. Um, I go to a party and someone says, what do you do? Uh, yeah, I'm a high school competitive robotics teacher. Nobody guesses that. Nobody <laughs> read it. Oh, I know it, you know. Now, understand I teach something called VEX Robotics. That's what we do. There's 12,000 high school teams in the world alone. This is now common. We have all kinds of amazing mechatronics and robotics technology around us. Unmanned orbiters, fancy word for space robot, right? Those space robots around the planet Earth, current operational, 1,071 of them. I mean, if aliens ever try to unveil, they're going to run into so many satellites, they won't know what hit them. Um, so we have that around Mars. We even have five around Mars, different, different planet. We have them all around other than, I think, two main planets. Um, but what, of course, excites me about Mars is this thing. This is a Curiosity. Um, Curiosity is one of the nine tons of robots we have attempted to land on Mars. We've left a few craters. We've missed a few times and haven't done right. But almost all the systems there have exceeded operations, uh, expectations. They, uh, somebody on this planet has a business card that says, Robot Driver, Mars. I mean, wouldn't I like that, eh? Um, but in this mix, for me and for some others, I have a worry about doomsdays in our world. Um, growing up as a kid, there was, you know, an apocalyptic war concept of World War III. That exists still, but I'm hoping that it's become less. We're now wor worried about things like catastrophic climate changes, where the climate itself, raising, rising sea levels, perhaps leading to... Uh, well, it could lead to the warfare, it could lead to uh, pandemics with diseases out of control. Uh, we still face the same danger that wiped out what we believe the dinosaurs, a, a giant asteroid hit. Um, of course, we could have zombies. Well, okay, we really can't have zombies because there's no biology to support that. But we even have, believe it or not, every government pretty much in the world has uh, plans for how to defend against aliens. But if we have aliens, we could have zombie aliens. So zombies are back on the table. Um, <laughs> The uh, thing go going on here is how can I possibly teach a skill that I'm pretty convinced is going to help kids use the technologies that are available, which aren't going to be the same as right now, 10 years from now they'll radically change. What can I teach them that is going to help them through this moment in history that may come? Um, I think I have the answer, and how I'm going to tell you is through a story, and I'm going to start the story all the way back in 1904 with my own grandfather, born in Bristol, England. He uh, came to Canada before he was three, sometimes in his, when he was two. He uh, lived in uh, Kelowna, BC, till he was 18. Um, somehow then he became a wireless operator, which he was supposed to be 21, but I think my grandpa lied about how old he was. So he became a wireless operator, and he got to go on this thing. This is the Canadian Highlander in 1922 in the port of Vancouver. My grandfather then took this amazing technology. Understand wireless operator repairman is one of the highest tech jobs on the planet at this time. And he sailed all around the world for seven years. He even got stuck in a river in a tidal wave, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, but travels the whole world, meets all kinds of people. Seven years later, comes home, marries the girl next door, right? That's how obviously that works, <laughs> right? Um, he then decided to not go back to sea. He started becoming an electrician um, and became a very good one, very good technician. The uh, next place I'm going to take you, I'm going to transport you 21 years into the future now. 
This is uh, his future, is 1943. This is a little town that doesn't really exist anymore up the coast of BC, it's called Ocean Falls. Ocean Falls is a going concern of 4,000 people, well nearly, but 4,000 people. It has a giant mill, you notice on the top, you notice the mill's as big as the town. That mill uh, provides paper, pulp, lumber, plywood, uh, it's part of a war, right? Um, there's hospitals, there's a there's hospital, there's a theater, there's schools, there's even swimming pools. It's, it's a neat little city, company town. My grandfather is the chief electrician at both the power plant that runs this and the entire mill. But one of the other jobs he does is he repairs U.S. naval destroyers that come in off the Pacific with holes shot in them and they're not working. By this point, my grandfather has been a wireman or a wireless operator for over 20 years. He's about knowledgeable as there is in the technology, and they come into port and go, Art, can you come down and fix this? My grandfather's name was Art. And he would often go down and do this, and my dad, being a skinny 10-year-old kid, would often go with him because he'd crawl in holes and fix, fix stuff, put wires together that my grandfather couldn't fit in or none of the other men on the ship. So my dad was servicing World War II destroyers. Um, this is a bad day, though, for my grandfather and my dad. My dad is up in that little hospital, and he's dying. He's dying of something called bacterial meningitis. In those days, that's a death sentence, uh, about a 99% kill rate. The doctor there, the young doctor there, is using the only technology he has available. He's put him in an ice bath to try to slow down the bacteria and hopefully maybe slow down you know, enough that my dad can survive. But doing that, the survival rate's 1%, so it's not very good. There is a knock at the door, though, and get up and open it, and there's a sailor standing there, and he asks my grandfather, All right, can you, I know why you're here, but could you come down and just look at the destroyer real quick? We got something I know you can help us with, and honest, if anything changes, I'll run down and get you. So I can't imagine as a parent being in that position, but you know, this is something you can do for half an hour where you can actually do something rather than just sit there. So my grandfather agrees to go down the ship at the dock. As he's walking on the ship, a voice yells out, hey, Art, how you doing? And he looks up, and here's one of the men he was on the freighter with. This man, who's an older guy now like him, who's now the ship's medical officer on this U.S. Navy ship. How you doing, Art? Horrible. This is the worst day of my life. What? What's up? Well, my son's up in the hospital. He's dying of something called bacterial meningitis. The doctor says, stop, we're going to see the captain. But I'm here to fix the ship. No, no, no. Come see. We're going to go see the captain. They go up to the captain, and the captain... And the medical officer come up with this great plan. A little while later, this thing here, because they got to, what they decide is they're going to fly between Bella Bella and Ocean Falls. There's no airport at Ocean Falls, but there is ocean, Ocean Falls, right? This is a PBY or Catalina flying boat. By the way, that's a picture of a young Todd in front of that airplane. And that may be the airplane that did this. We can't quite prove it because of wartime records. They, that's all secret stuff. But this is, it, it, most likely, that's the actual airplane that did this. And what this airplane did is it took off from the joint Canadian-American air base at Bella Bella, flew in about 30 minutes, landed at Ocean Falls, and they ran up to the hospital with a classified wonder drug called penicillin. My dad survives World War II because a group of people in a world where thousands of people can die on any day, they make the decision, not this one, kid. They use all the high tech that's available to them at that time, the radios, a flying boat, a wonder drug. My dad survives World War II, hence me, hence my kids, right? But so that amazing moment, right? So what the thing we can all teach, and it doesn't matter whether you're a educator or not. It doesn't matter whether you teach kindergarten to college. It doesn't matter whether you, like me, totally involved in robotics or not, in technology. The thing that we can teach our kids is to be compassionate and caring and try to save each other. I actually call it just being human. I use this tr phrase with my kids. But I got to show you the forest through the trees because I kind of misled you a little bit here in the beginning. Uh, that's my grandfather, my dad, myself, and my son. Teach your kids to be human. Thank you very much for your time.